I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to our presentation today. <clears throat> it's one that we're rather excited about. It's uh, <clears throat> going to be presented by uh, Jack Kerfoot, and Jack's going to speak on uh, Zenith Oil Terminal, multi-billion dollar risk to the Portland area. Uh, Jack has uh, extensive oil and gas experience. Uh, he spent 40 years traveling the world, uh, working with scientists, bureaucrats, tycoons, ministers, and heads of state. And he knows, knows all about the oil industry. And uh, he's, uh, uh, we're delighted to have him with us. Uh, Jack, with that, I'll turn it over to you and uh, leave it up to you to whether you want us all to turn our mutes on or when to ask questions and all that. All right, very good, Mike. Uh, for the time being, I think it would be good if uh, uh, people would put their mute buttons on and then we'll hold the questions to the end. The presentation I'm going to show today is something we are proposing engineers for a sustainable future to present to Portland City Commissioners on the Zenith Oil Terminal. And as Mike said, we believe the Zenith Oil Terminal is a multi-billion dollar risk to the Portland area. Now, it's important, my Zoom doesn't act up, here we go. The audience will be the Portland City Council. The objective is to educate, and to, to be candid, I believe multiple groups have tried to educate the Portland City Commission and are going to quantify those risks based on an analog of a diluted bitumen, which is called Dilbit, a spill that occurred 10 years ago in Michigan, a volume that is much smaller than the actual volumes that can be held at the Zenith Oil Terminal. We also want to discuss and identify policies to mitigate those risks. Now, the risk mitigation actions target all Dilbit import export operators in Portland. We do not target, we are, uh, the presentation does not target Zenith, simply because by this we were trying to implement, we believe it's important to implement policies and actions that will apply to all highly toxic uh, operations like Zenith oil does not require the cancellation of the existing Zenith oil terminal permits. Oh, now that's important for one reason. The hesitancy of the city of, Count of city of Portland to cancel these permits is they've been advised by legal counsel that it could result in litigation. So the approach is not to make it uh, cancel those permits whatever, uh, whatsoever, but we do want to implement actions that would make it financially unattractive to come to Portland with a Zenith oil type of operation and identified so we can protect Portland and the state of Oregon from future Dilbit oil operations. Now let's, the key thing to understand is the economics. And this is really when we talk about policies and procedures, we we'll start off with the cost of a tar sands. The extraction ranges from $46 to $53 a barrel. Mining, open pit mining is 46. The steam stimulation typically is the higher cost. Rail transport, 10 to 15. I would expect the rail transport down from Alberta, um, from Fort McMurray to be closer to the $15 range. So we can say the cost to extract and transport the oil to Portland is probably in the $60 a barrel range. Oil price is very based on the quality. West Texas Intermediate, WTI, right now is running about $72 a barrel. Western Canadian Select is around $56 a barrel. It has to do with the quality of oil itself. But the punchline and the reason Zenith is coming forward with this proposal to expand operation is Bank of America's forecast is by the end of 2022, we will see oil at 80 to 90 dollars a barrel and British Petroleum has been forecasting oil at over hundred dollars a barrel by 2030. We have to realize that Zenith is, funds come from investment bankers. Warburg is one of their larger investors and what they want is a payback to the, on their capital within a short period of time. 
in something that they perceive as low risk. The dual bid import export fee impact, we add a dollar a gallon for the import fee, obviously for, uh, per gallon, that it means $42 a barrel, an oil marine export fee of another dollar a gallon, that's $42 a, a barrel. So the end of the day, we add $84 to the cost of Dilbert oil. And we make it unattractive today and foreseeable future. And really what we want is to see Zenith pull, up, up, pull out their operations, close down, and then it would be much easier to get Portland City Council to implement actions that would prohibit setting up in the future Dilbert operations. So this is the presentation for the Portland City Council. Obviously a map of the operation at Zenith Oil and the aerial view shows that the oil tankers, oil uh, tanks are just a few hundred feet from the Willamette River. It traces the history all the way back to 1947 with an asphalt refinery, then the conversion in 2013 to Arc Logistics, and then the sale of or acquisition of that by Zenith Energy in 2017. Zenith saw an opportunity. They can't ship the oil west and export it by British Columbia. British Columbia refuses to take it. They can't ship it east. They can't ship it by pipeline because most pipelines will refuse to take it because it, has, it is so viscous, it plugs up the pipeline. So the cost to the pipeline company is not there. So they can't ship it down export by Washington, because Washington, the state of Washington is astute enough to understand uh, the risk, as is California. But they saw a window of opportunity by limited oversight or a lack of oversight by the state of Oregon. Oops, I'm sorry, let's go back here. I got a jumpy computer today. Okay. So we have to realize when we talk about Zenith, we're talking about 1.5 million barrels of oil, which is 63.7 million gallons. Now that does, and this is right from Zenith Oil, that does not include the oil that could be stored on the rail tank cars. If the facilities are near capacity and your uh, a new shipment of oil tank cars are brought in, you could hold, I'm going to guess, close to over 65 million gallons of dual oil. All right, what is bitumen? Well, it's oil from the tar sands. It's sand, it's bitumen, it's clay, and it's water. Viscous semi-solid tar-like substance, it's carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And the extraction techniques are surface mining. There are three major surface mines in Alberta, Canada, and also steam uh, extraction techniques. Again, I've already shown you the extraction costs. Hi, babe, did you get my... Um, Excuse me, if we could mute... ...that I was taking a webinar? If we could uh, on mute, a mute ourselves, please. Thank you. Bitumen processing. The bitumen must be diluted to transport. And the most common dilutant is benzene, which is carcinogenic, which is why the rail cars that come into the Zenith oil terminal, almost every one of them, have a toxic, toxic warning on the side of that car. So Zenith oil, the tar sands primarily are coming from the Fort McMurray area, Northeastern Alberta, then through Montana, Idaho, and Oregon by rail. This is a typical mining operation. This is a steam extraction process. There's open pit mines, steam extraction. Again, diluting this oil is critical for transport. Pipelines is very rare these days because of the cost. So rail is the most common technique. And then from Portland, it shipped out through the Willamette to the Columbia River and then overseas. Now Zenith says, oh, it's, we've sold shipments of oil in California, but most of their oil that they ship out goes to China and to Korea. Now let's, this is the most important thing I think we need to emphasize. What is an analog to a Dilbert oil spill? Well, we have it in 2010, Kalamazoo River. It was a, a pipeline burst. It was ruptured and they shut it down after one hour. 
about 1 million gallons that went into the river. We have to realize in this dill bit, 70% of it is the bitumen and that sinks. So the spill had to be contained. Kalamazoo River was closed completely for two years and partially closed or segments of it were closed for another two to three years. The total cleanup cost of 2014 was $1.2 billion. Today, those costs have now- I'm going to do a check. Over $1.5 million, $1.5 billion. Mundo? Excuse me, if we could please uh, mute ourselves. Mundo? If we could mute ourselves, please. Thank you. All right, we have to realize that that was 1 million gallons and Zenith's terminal holds the capacity of 63.7, and I would argue potentially as much as 65 million gallons. So let's take a look at another factor here as well. The Zenith oil terminal is on an earthquake liquefaction zone. So loosely packed water and saturated sediments. This is a map showing the highest risk areas. The red areas are the high risk areas. There is Zenith. Now, the key words here are this, the structure of the soil lose strength due to a major ground shaking. Most people think of an earthquake. This is an example in Japan. It was a 7.5 uh, earthquake on the Richter scale. About 31 miles is where the epicenter was. And of course, these are large buildings that literally toppled over and the foundations collapsed. However, it's important to realize it doesn't have to be an earthquake. If you had a planned explosion, like at the Zenith oil terminal, that could trigger it as well. It depends on where the epicenter is. It depends on the magnitude. So you could have liquefaction occur with a four and a half or a five, depending on where the epicenter is. And when we're talking about these tanks, these oil tanks are not as well, uh, the structures are not as rooted as these buildings are, and the risk for a spill is, it's almost a certainty. Let's take a look at the operational risk. We could have facility fire. If we look at the Houston area, there are 10 major refineries or operations, chemical plant operations in the immediate area of the Houston area. And they average a major fire and or an explosion about one every two to three years. So it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Then we have marine oil tanker collisions. Once it's exported, it goes on a marine oil tanker and then it makes its way up the Willamette to the Columbia. And the probability of marine oil tanker collisions are certain, certainly a possibility. Railroad oil tanker derailments, the riskiest form of oil transport is by rail. And then finally, earthquake liquefaction. So it's likely for a spill in all of these cases combined. Now our environmental risks emanating from Portland, river ecosystems destroyed for tens of miles. Willamette River would be completely closed for two years for cleanup and partially closed for probably another three to five or more years, depending on the volume. Impact likely an order of magnitude worse than spill in Michigan, simply because Kalamazoo was 1 million gallons. We have a capacity much larger than that. Let's take a look and quantify the impact. Oh, also we have, of course, the facility fire, which could cause major explosions, toxic smoke, and again, fatalities. And then of course, with an explosion, it could trigger earthquake liquefaction. Drill bit scenarios. We talk about risk, we try and define the range of potential outcomes. So a low case, I would say, okay, 1% storage of the storage capacity is spilled into the river. High case, 31 million gallons. Yes, that's less than half, but for whatever reason, it's partially filled. So you could argue that's mean, but I'd call this a high case just so we can be conservative in the type of damage we're talking about. Low case, the spill would go downstream 10 to 15 miles with a light crude, creating a, a sheen, a 
oil, toxic oil going down the stream 10 to 15 miles. The Willamette River would be closed for at least one to two years, dredging up the bitumen, so the port would be shut down. All port and river traffic would be shut down for at least one to two years. Contamination on shore and contamination of groundwater. Let us not forget that the oil that's used to dilute the bitumen is benzene. It's a carcinogen and it will cause an increase in cancer. Oil spill cleanup, conservatively, or even relatively small percentage, is at least a billion dollars. High case, we would see that oil sheen or that oil spill go down to the mouth of Columbia. Willamette would be closed in at least two to three years, all traffic, and probably a major portion of the Columbia River closed for all traffic. Think what the impact will have on the commerce. Oil spill cleanup would be well over $40 billion. I've talked to a couple of agencies that think that's probably a very low ball or a conservative number. The Zenith Oil Terminal has limited forecasted revenue and a tepid credit rating. And that's about as kind as I can say. Uh, to put it another way, they barely have two dimes to rub together. Done in Bradstreet, they have 45 employees in nine different operations across the United States. And they have a projected sales forecast, which is basically revenue, of $14.8 million. So earnings is virtually nil. Now, if there was a spill, they would have to mobilize equipment from either the Cook Inlet or probably the Gulf of Mexico. And their credit rating isn't exactly stellar. It's a B minus and then outlook remains negative. So they would have to be, they would mandate it to, for any equipment to be mobilized to pay that cash up front uh, for the mobilization and for the rental of the equipment. And they show no sign of having this money. Okay, what actions could we take? Well, we could take a $1 a gallon on an all dill bit oil stored within the city of Portland, call it a high hazard oil import fee, and a $1 a gallon all, uh, on all oil exported, because that's a secondary risk when we start to offload it onto vessels onto the river that would be put into an environmental remediation account. Policy actions. All deal that marine operations will have at least one certified spill response person on site 24 seven. When they were last audited by the state in environmental quality, they were cited for having access. Well, they had one person, I think it was probably a consultant that lived over a four hour away drive to the facility. We want them on site 24 seven. And in a spill, timing is critical. The Valdez operation with the Valdez spill with the Alaska tanker that uh, ran aground and ruptured and spilled oil. The lesson learned from that for Exxon was that their approval authority for a multi-million dollar mobilization of spill response equipment had to, could not be done locally. It had to go all the way to Las Colinas. Texas. That took 72 hours for that oil, uh, for that approval to get uh, the expenditure to be approved. And then it took another 72 or more hours for the equipment to really arrive on site. So that probably increased the damage of the spill two to three times. Export operations will maintain spill response equipment on site. We want to make sure they don't have to mobilize it for, from the Cook Inlet or from the Gulf of Mexico. These are containment booms and flotation devices, skimmers, sorbents. Spill response will be inspected and certified to be operational annually by the city. The reason for that, we simply don't want this stuff to be thrown aside. We want to make sure that the spill response equipment is fully operational and can be used at a moment's notice. And all 
Marine Export Operations will provide the city 72 hours notice of all high uh, hazard oil marine export. That's just a basic safety procedure relative to other vessels in the area to mitigate the risk. These would be considered standard operating procedure in places like Louisiana or Texas. All uh, deal bit marine exports will provide the city a monthly report on all high hazard oil and storage, oil quality, composition, and storage of the tanks. Now, why is that? First of all, for firefighters, they need to know what they're fighting and how much oil they actually have on site. Another factor is you have realized at the federal level that there is a spill, will assess fines based on the volume of oil. In the case of the BP blowout of a condo, BP was trying to fraudulently represent that the spill was only a few hundred barrels a day when the evidence was compelling that the spill rates from that wellhead, Macondo, were well in excess of 20,000 and probably closer to 40,000 barrels a day. Multi-million barrel fines result in multi-billion dollar, or multi-million barrel spills result in multi-billion dollar fines. So the conclusions, a deal bit oil spill would devastate our ecosystem, obviously. Area farmlands, <coughs> excuse me, and the groundwater. Portland, the regional economy, and I'm emphasizing this because if we have so many people in the business sector that really don't understand the oil and gas sector and still think that the uh, Coos Bay LNG project would be a wonderful thing. Um, Zenith does not have the personnel to handle a deal with oil spill, certainly not on site. And I, from everything I can tell in their entire operation in the United States. And they certainly don't have the financial resources to pay for major deal build operations. So it represents a multi-billion dollar risk to the state of Oregon and certainly the city of Portland. Okay, so the next steps, and this is where we can unmute and ask questions at the point in time, but what, what uh, we are seeking, Engineers for a Sustainable Future, ESF, is to attach organization's logo on the presentation, if you believe this is something you can support, collaborate to show the presentation to all available local media. It's an approach that hasn't been necessarily taken in the past. Collaborate to show the presentation to state representatives. We'll schedule, try and schedule Zoom calls with city council members, Dan Ryan and Mingus Maps, who I had, I do know, uh, and then hopefully the city council. I would say also we can uh, try and knock I on the door of Sam Adams. Adams. Uh, when he and I were running for city council, uh, one of the issues I talked about at the time was closing down uh, Zenith Oil. And he said, well, we can't do that. Now I mentioned this, uh, a fee and he looked at me and he goes, well, that's a good idea. That's something we could do. We need to do that. So I think we've got at least a willing audience in that. And I think uh, Dan, and Mingus will also listen. And then collaborate to identify follow actions on Zenith Oil. If we can implement these policies and make it uneconomic and see Zenith close down, then the next step is to hit a full court press to ensure that we have legislation in place that prohibits any future operations like this setting up. Okay, any questions? Michael. Uh, great presentation, Jack. Thanks. You covered a lot of the environmental uh, damage that could occur from this. Um, one thing I think is worth elaborating a little bit more on are the climate risks. Um, it's my understanding that uh, tar sands are at the upper end of the scale when it comes to uh, climate because of the uh, processes used to extract it from the ground and turn it into fuel. So perhaps you could just elaborate on that. It's a good point. Uh, and I think, I'm trying to think if there's something worse than that. Um, I think it is, if not, if it's not high, the upper end member, it is close to it. But yes, that's a good point. Thank you, Michael. Hi, this is Melanie Plout. I'd like to make a point, Jack. Sure. Um, I really appreciate your presentation. You obviously have a great deal of expertise. There's one, I think, weak point here, which is that 
Zenith is no longer shipping tar sands oil. Um, I have been tracking uh, Zenith since 2018. I'm a retired physician. I know a number of people in the ESF group. Um, we know from looking at the trains that have been at Zenith that there has been a mix of Bakken and tar sands for the last uh, couple of years. But um, on a recent DEQ webinar call that had a Zenith rep there, a fellow named J.T. Hendricks, he stated that in the last four months, Zenith has not handled any tar sands. There is no dill bit coming through Zenith now. It is all coming from the Bakken. Um, I think your points about the cleanup of dill bit, which is the tar sands, are you know, very appropriate comments, but I'm not sure we can anymore hang our hat on the difficulties with cleaning up, um, you know, this heavy type of oil like they had, the problems that they had in Kalamazoo. Um, a couple of other points. Excuse Melanie, I would point out one thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, my would challenge that comment um, <laughs> from uh, Zenith. Uh, the question, what, what they're looking to do, they may say that's a fact for the last, let's say six months or 12 months, which is which it may be true. Uh, I tend based on their record not to have much faith in what they say, but let's just say that's probably true for the last six months. What yeah. they're looking to do is to expand their operations. And well, the, they, they have them. actually, they have a permit to build some new offloading ramps but those offloading ramps have a, um, a, a concession that they have given to the city that in the new offloading ramps, they will only be handling um, biofuels and that the city is requiring a third party confirmation quarterly that they are only handling biofuels on that expansion. Um, so, it's a little complicated as to whether or not the expansion is actually an expansion of crude oil. Um, we know that if they're currently handling biofuels in their current offloading ramps, they could put that into the new ones and handle more crude oil um, in, the, in the existing ramps. But it, you know, uh, specifically the city did say that their, their expansion, which they now have a stormwater permit for, um, for the building of those new racks, that those new racks are not to be used for crude oil. The city did not grant a land use compatibility statement for that. Um, I've been tracking the ships that leave the Zenith dock. They use the Chevron dock there with an app called Marine Tracker. And in the last, it, while it's true that in the beginning, those ships were going overseas to Korea and China back in 2018, early 2019, um, in recent years, all of those ships have gone to U.S. refineries in um, Alaska, Washington, or California. So I, again, I think we need to be careful in saying that Zenith is shipping overseas because um, it doesn't look as though that is currently true. Although, of course, we don't know where, um, you know, where the oil from those refineries is going, but it's certainly not going directly to Asia as it was originally when Zenith first started operating. What you have to, what I think you have to recognize is what they're looking at is not what it is the steady state today. What they're looking for is the price of oil to go up. They're looking to sell, a, make a pitch to Warburg or other investment bankers that are looking for the price of oil to go up and that they can get a supply of oil to come up. Yes, they may be using Bakken today, but if the tar sands operations prices go up and there's an opportunity, I think you will start to see an influx of oil coming in from the tar sands. It's possible, but I, I'm not sure that our argument to city council of shutting them down based on um, handling deal bid is going to be effective. Um, we did also get information from DEQ about their spill response um, rules. And apparently there is state regulation that says that the spill drills that, they are that DEQ is required to have Zenith run are based on the size of the single largest tank. Um, they really don't have um, 
you know, they really don't have the vision of the big one happening and everything coming into the water at once uh, with the liquefaction of the soils. Um, and, and Zenith's largest uh, tank is about 3 million. Um, I forget now if it's barrels or gallons, but- um, It would be gallons. It's gallons, yeah. Um, so it would require state <laughs> legislation to change some of the spill response issues that we have. Um, I'm sure you've heard that, you know, we are waiting this week on a decision from the city about the land use compatibility statement for the Title V air quality permit. And we do think still that that is our best bet to get the city to say that they will not allow um, this land use, that it is not compatible with what the city wants. Um, we have had a lot of contact with people at the city. And when I say we, I mean Physicians for Social Responsibility, the Breach Collective, Craig Law, uh, 350 PDX, multiple organizations have been in touch with the city. And I really do appreciate that the Engineers for Sustainable Future also would like to be in touch with the city. I would suggest that it would be good to actually reach out today and say that the engineers also are concerned about Zenith, but perhaps the Dilbit argument is not the strongest argument that we have today. So I, I'll, I'll leave the questions for other folks and I'd be happy to talk further. Great, right, thank you. Dirk, uh, my name is Anton Schmidt. Um, you know, I, I there was a spool about two or three years back on the rail line, there was a derailment uh, next to the Columbia River. Um, and that affected the, the Indian, uh, the tribal people quite uh, severely. I, I know a guy who's in the uh, Indian executive, if you want to call it that, and, and he was telling me, you know, it caused, caused a lot of suffering. That could also be a, uh, a reason to limit um, the amount of oil tankers being uh, brought into uh, uh, Portland. That's a good point. I mean, there are many reasons that we, that I, I just, the, they picked this location for one simple reason. They saw an opportunity to convert uh, a terminal into an oil uh, export terminal. I mean, we're talking 85, 90 kilometer or miles from the, from the mouth of the Columbia. And so it was an opportunity of convenience and uh, the rail transport offered that opportunity. Um, but I would agree that when we're talking about marine and or rail transport, the risks go up significantly. Yeah, I, I, I would charge the, put a, put a surcharge on, on each tanker coming in on the rail line or something like that, you know, that, that uh, to, to you know, discourage um, well, going through Portland, I mean, we just, I, I don't know, I just don't agree with it. Well, actually, the governor, I believe it was two years ago or three years ago, um, enacted a, I think, a one or two dollar uh, barrel fee on oil tra uh, being transported through the state by rail. And she used the term, um, she didn't, it wasn't associated with API gravity or Dilbert. It was another term that she used. And I think, let's see, go back. That was what she was trying to do initially, which is one of the reasons I use that uh, term. Um, high hazard oil import fee. She referred to it as a high hazard oil. Uh, and I couldn't find any more specific designation on what she considered a high hazard oil, but uh, we could certainly, I haven't put a definition of that and it could be associated with specific gravity of the oil and components such as that. So there are different ways to handle it. Yeah. And I would agree, but the first thing, the first step that I see is we want to try and restrict and make it uneconomic for Zenith to uh, continue to operate. Right.
This is Jenny O'Connor. I had a question about whether or not anyone has been analyzing the impact on the rail infrastructure, <clears throat> given the fact that a lot more oil trains are coming in, which means there's a lot more impact on the rails because of the, um, you know, because of the weight. And, um, I, you know, I just, I just wanted to flag that because are they monitoring the rail infrastructure? Is it the same? Is it, you know, is it getting worse? Is it deteriorating because of the additional um, importing? Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Great. Uh, that's not my area of, of expertise. It's a great question or a great point. Uh, I don't know how the weight of an oil tanker uh, car compares to a um, other loads that they may carry, such as coal. Um, but uh, I have no idea. I'd, I'd just like to interject uh, something here, if I could, Jack. I think uh, the overriding concern is is that. Uh, we have extensive oil storage facilities right on the banks of the Willamette River in an oil and a, um, um, a soil liquefaction zone. And when I talked to uh, Dr. Uh, Scott Burns the other day, he uh, said this is something the city should be acutely aware aware of and, and concerned about. They, uh, it's just regardless of the gravity of the oil, uh, it poses a uh, uh, a, a large uh, environmental risk to the city of Portland and to everyone along the river. Um, and irregardless of, this, of the gravity of the oil, whether it's still bed or light oil or, or whatever, it's going to create a huge problem. Bob I, Bob, I would agree with you from that standpoint. That's why, although I've discussed uh, diluted bitumen oil, uh, you could certainly include a wide range of factors in that. Yeah, and that's why I wanted to get back. The, the paradigm for many is that it's going to take um, a eight or a nine uh, Richter scale earthquake to uh, trigger, trigger this. That's not the case at all. Like I said, even an explosion in the refinery. And, well, Dr. Uh, Burns was... Uh... He's a geologist. Many of you know him, I, I would imagine. But he uh, he said that uh, the uh, West Hills Fault, which runs right through that area, basically, is uh, could pose a uh, um, an earthquake. Uh, it present an earthquake in the order of a seven and a half uh, yeah. on the Richter scale, and that would be certainly enough to cause big problems there in those oil storage facilities. And the proximity of that, most of the, the earthquakes that we read about in the six or seven or even four and five typically are 30 miles or 50 miles offshore. But yes, you're, he, Dr. Burns, Scott is absolutely correct. And, now they'd be sitting virtually on the epicenter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. So the, the range of outcomes for a spill are far more diverse, and the which means the probability for this to happen are significantly higher than I personally believe most people recognize. Jack, uh, I'm curious as to um, whether uh, What what uh, what could be the impact on the city of Portland in the case of uh, a major spill? Not just the the rivers, but uh, the city as a whole. And is it possible that the city would the city itself would become unusable for a certain period of time? Well, the range of outcomes that I think you would see is if we're, we're talking about um, oils that have uh, carcinogens in them, like benzene base, then you would see contamination in the groundwater and contamination in the soils. So all the marine uh, fauna and flora would, would disappear, would die. You would have contamination downstream, the soil of the islands, where there are many large farms from that standpoint. 
uh, you would shut down the, the uh, river traffic for at least one and sometime probably more than that and restrict traffic for up to five years. So that's what I was trying to touch on is you would see a spike in cancer. You would see a devastating effect on the economy relative to marine traffic in and out. So any farms that are here will can no longer use the uh, river because it will be shut down with dredges trying to remove the dill bit or contain the spill. Um, so I, I think what you would see is the city would be, would be faced with a basically a shutdown of most of the businesses and um, we would start to see some very severe uh, health hazards or health impacts to the people that did stay behind. And one uh, more, one, one more question: uh, What if if uh, Zenith is is undercapitalized, as as you indicate, uh, and a, a, such a, a disaster uh, were to occur? Uh, do you expect that Zenith would simply de declare bankruptcy and uh, and walk away? And if so, uh, would it be the state the state that would have to pay uh, put out the uh, billions of dollars for cleanup? It would be the city and the state. That's exactly right. It is an LLC, and they have ring fenced them each individually, and then ring fenced them in the U.S. Uh, the headquarters, from best I can tell, are up in Calgary. Um, so yes, they'll simply dust their hands and walk away. I think it's really important in your presentation to, to council to emphasize uh, the financial liability that the city as well as the state would would have. Mark, I, I agree completely. That's, a, that's good counsel for me. Uh, I think someone in particular like Mayor Wheeler would perhaps uh, take that to heart uh, more than some of the other issues. Mm -hmm. well, okay. I think it has a much wider effect because, and I, and I wrote a note in the chat column, um, all your imports and exports would stop. Use wheat, for example. Yeah. And you wouldn't be able to export wheat and that would affect the farmers, but not only that, the um, displacement of all the workers. I mean, let's just take the people that operate the locks, that operate the barges, that operate everything. Their, their unemployment would, would rise very dramatically. Absolutely. The economic import, now I haven't tried to do any sort of modeling from that standpoint, but uh, even in my high case, it would basically mean Quite candidly, it would be the end of the city as we know it. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of another, and if there is another analog that something like this has happened um, in a large metropolitan area where you've had something like this. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't want to use Chernobyl as an example because that's a different type of uh, uh, contamination uh, to a different extreme, but uh, it would, uh, the other areas where we've had spills like Valdez, um, the oil was lighter and it was a remote area, but the environmental damage was unquestionable. It took well over a decade to try and recover most of that. Uh, Macondo was far enough offshore that they were able to uh, respond uh, minimize the damage, although oil did get into the wetlands area um, and it did have economic devastation to the fishing and the shrimping communities along Louisiana. But there they had um, a spill response, a collaborative spill response that, uh, and they have large substantial spill response equipment there. So they were able to respond very quickly. But uh, yeah, I. <laughs> I, I think we would define a new member, in member in a catastrophic scenario, um, to be honest. And I think it would, I think we would, it would be the end of Portland uh, as a um, city for quite some time. You know, you aren't going to be just dealing with a 
what is perhaps a massive oil spill in the river, but you're going to, the, the city uh, for a, uh, a large measure and the surrounding suburbs are going to be without gas and electricity, maybe sewer and water. That's a good point. And, uh, you're, and the liquefaction zone just doesn't pertain to that, uh, with the oil storage facilities, but there are a large number of buildings in Portland that are going to be affected by that. You'll find them tilting by the, when this is all over <laughs> and unoccupable. Occupable. So it, uh, it's, uh, it's going to come at a very bad time when the city is reeling from lots of other problems. And to deal with an oil spill on top of that, it's going to compound things in a very bad way. Well, we have to realize that with an oil spill, it will take time to clean up. And you're talking about a very flammable substance in the river. So even if it is uh, not a dilbit oil, but a lighter oil, depending on the volume that you're talking about, that it will shut down operations for an extended period of time. Um, again, you're dealing with a flammable substance on the rivers and uh, you, you will shut down all marine traffic altogether. Forget anyone, and no one will want to go in the water. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it is something you, people don't want to think about, uh, which is some re reason perhaps they sort of push it aside. And uh, it's like climate change. No one wants to think about the ultimate impact of climate change, but it is, uh, it's not a, it is a very ugly thought that we will be faced with. Are, are you going to be presenting to uh, members of the, the council one-on-one uh, -on -one, or are you gonna to present to the, the council as a, a, a group? Well, my thought is that um, I would start with one, uh, one of the two commissioners and uh, see what they would recommend. That, that, would be, that would be my approach if someone has a better idea. I mean, what I want to do is, shall we say, work the audience first and then seek an opportunity for a, a presentation to the city council. Yeah. I think we're going to have to refine our understanding of just uh, how much deal bit oil, you know, based on the comments. Um, I can't remember the lady's name who spoke, but she made some great points. And uh, Melanie Plout. Is that Melanie? Yeah, yeah. Melanie you did a great job in, uh, in pointing out some things that uh, I wasn't aware of. And But we're going to need to make sure that we uh, target the real problem and not one that we imagine to be the case. Well, Bob, I, I think what you've got to recognize is that the, the, the dynamics of this, their their goal is to demonstrate that they can increase their capabilities because they're regardless of what oil they use because they're trying to get more investment capital yeah. they don't have the capital themselves so they're trying to position themselves what they're looking for is an investor that sees the oil price to go up and sees a midstream operation like this which is basically transport and shipping out of the oil um, as a low risk uh, low economic investment to a good potential rate of return type of opportunity. So they're looking for the increase in oil price to be the instigator of more opportunities for expansion. If not here, somewhere else that they can set up. Oil is the one that they're most comfortable with because that will has a much higher probability of increase in price than natural gas does. So my comment is they may be using they, like I, like any time I see something from Zenith, I simply respectfully ask to see, show me the data. Um, we have to realize this is the same company that uh, said to the DEQ two years ago, when they asked them to demonstrate their spill response capabilities, they said, oh, well, this is the type of oil we use. So they put benzoil, which is a very light oil into the water. And of course, they were able to uh, get that very quickly. And they didn't, they failed to tell the DEQ that, uh, that they were actually had been uh, dill bit oil, bitumen based oil on the facility. So when you have a, a company like this, then you want to make sure that you have got everything in place from that standpoint. Um, 
their credibility to, with me based on their operational history uh, is, um, is very low. One thing, uh, too, the Dilbit oil is, uh, you know, the tar sands oil is very expensive to extract. And, and uh, during COVID, the uh, price of oil dropped uh, down below the profitable level for that uh, uh, tar sands oil. And maybe now if it gets back to $100 a, a barrel, according to that one projection, uh, they could begin producing it and they'll want to ship it by rail again. So I, I, would, I don't know what prevents that's, that's, doing that's, that. That's the point I'm trying to make. They may come in and say, right now we're using Bakken oil, but I think I think if you look at a, a compositional analysis of the Bakken oil, that's not as clean and pristine as uh, as they would like to uh, present it as, depending on what type, the depth of the reservoir and the type of oil they have. So from that standpoint, I would say um, that what they use today may not be what they use tomorrow because they're simply looking at margins. Wow. You, do, you, do you know, uh, Jack, whether the Portland Business Alliance uh, has taken a position on, uh, on Zenith? I know there are people that say, that in their minds, they just see this as another attack. Uh, they don't differentiate, let's say, Zenith from a Chevron um, gasoline terminal, okay? Or a gasoline storage facility. And so what we have with many in the business community, from what I can tell, is a lack of understanding. Their idea, I mean, I, I met with several of them once several years ago when they were just thought that Coos Bay was the best thing since sliced bread. And I said, well, first of all, you do realize that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, turned down their proposal to open an a LNG export terminal. And I said, well, yeah, that wasn't good. And I said, well, the, do you know why? And they said, well, no. And I said, well, they said, in 2006, they expected there was 20, there were 23 LNG export terminals in the United States, and they expect the demand for LNG to decline, and that the economics would not justify an LNG export terminal at that time. And when they turned it down, the LNG prices were $10 per standard cubic feet. Since that time, they've dropped down to five and they've dropped down to three dollars in that scenario. Um, so there's still so the, the momentum for this uh, terminal is is uh, being driven by the gas producers in Canada, and so they have hired a pipeline company, Pemba Pipeline, to try and keep pushing this uh, uh, permitting for an LNG pipeline and terminal. And as long as the pipeline company is paid by the gas producers, they will. So it is. The level of understanding is not very high on this. Now, the answer, specifically, are there people that think Zenith is just uh, should be left alone and continue to operate? They may simply look at it and say, there's enough anti-business sentiment in Portland. We need to back off and let them to continue to operate. They haven't done anything wrong. That is the reason that I want to talk about the outcome of a potential spill. Yeah. Uh, Jack? Yes, Mike. Uh, there's, there's several chats here uh, okay. that you might want to just look at briefly and maybe respond to those that you can in a relatively short period of time. Well, one says, let's see, it becomes apparent that there is significant risk from the whole CEI hub, but Zenith should be the low hanging fruit since none of the product is used locally. In the long run, all the tanks should be removed. I certainly agree with that. Question is, how do we get there? Um, Their history of lying is why the city required third-party testing of biofuels to grant the LUCs. My comment would be, uh, make sure that you have a reputable 
company to test and to make sure they have the ability to test uh, in an unscheduled manner. Yeah. Uh, because if they don't have, uh, if they know there's a scheduled test, there are a lot of things they can do to, uh, shall we say, camouflage what they're really doing. Oh. Um, Uh, they have, let's see, um, sorry. We need to understand a strategy that presents zenith growth or regrowth of business because they happen to stay open without dealing with Dilbit should, be, uh, should not be a reason to ignore Dilbit. It should be an opportunity to close off restarting of Dilbit uh, handline. That is really the point I would agree with. Let's, you know, if we can try and close the avenues on the little bit, uh, continue to look for other avenues as well, but uh, start there and close that door for good and then uh, bring about new legislation that uh, ensures that it doesn't come back. Uh, doesn't own any of the oil. They are a storage and transloading. Uh, yes, they are a midstream company. They, uh, well, actually, they're U.S. operations based in Houston, but corporately, everything I would say looks like they are a Canadian company. Right now, the uh, commissioners won't talk about Zenith per their lawyer's advice until the LUCS decision. What is their liability insurance coverage? I have not been able to find that. That is a very good question. What are the government's requirements? Uh, this is where you call in FEMA uh, or uh, federal, more than likely federal assistance as well. Should their upgrade of their liability uh, be discussed? That's a good point. That's a very good point. Look at this recent uh, draft study and make comments. Uh, well, the, uh, it seems an interesting question, how sustainable the Columbia banks are to oil invasion. Um, that's another interesting question, and it's a good one. Um, I will tell you that uh, the invasion in Louisiana on the banks from uh, Wakanda was substantial. Um, would have a wider effect by stopping all imports and exports of wheat. That's certainly true of everything. I'm thinking of the farmers in uh, Sorby Island that use the river to ship their goods uh, to other areas in Oregon and also uh, outside of the state. Another link, Indian Affairs. Well, that's, a, that's a good one, okay. Don't other, uh, other jurisdictions rely on the Willamette for their water? Okay. I'm not sure, but I, you know, I, I seem to recall that. Well, the potential impact goes all the way down to the Columbia. Um, well, yeah, I know all of these things add up, so. Uh, Melanie, I see you have a hand up there. Uh, did you want to speak? Oh, again? sorry, I forgot. I forgot to put my hand down. But I will say one thing. Um, you know, DEQ is going to be having its Title V permit hearings, and there will be a public process. This is specifically about air quality. But I think um, you know, it's an opportunity for all of us to weigh in with oh. our concerns about the Zenith facility. So um, please stay alert to those notifications. You can get on DEQ's um, list to be notified about um, their public process. And, and 
it is the air quality permit that the land use compatibility statement um, from the city is still pending. So it, it's gonna be a very hot issue, this uh, Title V air quality permit. Just encourage everyone to get involved, check. Very good, thank you. Well, I think I've gone through all the chat questions. If I have not, or if I've missed someone's, please speak up now. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Melanie to uh, talk if she has knowledge of the Multnomah County uh, position that they have publicized recently. Yeah, you know, um, both all, both all of the Multnomah County commissioners and 20 um, state representatives recently came out opposed to the city granting this land use compatibility statement. So there really is a big, um, you know, there's, a, there's a, a lot of support out there from everybody um, opposing the city granting the land use compatibility statement. And it's not too late to add your voices and to leave a message on Dan Ryan's uh, phone machine or any other commissioner that you happen to have contact with and to let them know that engineers too don't want Zenith to be continuing to operate here. No matter what the justification is, right now we're hanging our hats a little bit on them denying this land use compatibility statement. Um, but there may be other fights in the future, like at the air quality spot. But this is the moment really right now to get in touch with your city council members. Jack. Thank you. Well, right. it's a little bit after one, Jack. Did you have anything else? No, I just think that, uh, again, if there are people or groups that would like to support this type of presentation to be made to our city commissioners. We would appreciate you sending to Mike Unger uh, your logo or just a brief note that you support it. And uh, we would appreciate that very much. You bet. I And uh, anyone who wants to work with us, uh, if you could send us uh, your email address. Uh, I know some of you probably are already on our or email list because you're 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 here, but some people may not uh, have heard from somebody else. If you're anxious and interested in working with us, please send me an email, and that's Mike Unger at Comcast.net. Uh, and uh, also, any engineer that wants a professional development hour, please let me know, and I'll I'll send that to you. Anything else before we call it a day here? I just want to thank Jack a lot for doing this work and for stimulating a, a, what I think has been a, a, a great discussion here over the last hour. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Jack. We look forward to, to working with everybody on this. Absolutely. We just need to come together and recognize that this is not something that makes sense in any stretch of the imagination, environmentally, climate-wise, or even economically. Well, thank you all. Good thank point, you. Jack. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, thank you. All right. Thanks, Melanie. I appreciate your input.